This audio program is presented by Lightshine Media. Lightshine, advancing a thinking faith. Can God Tell Time? By Don K. Preston. Almost 2,000 years ago, John the Baptizer said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. Jesus, the Son of God, echoed those same words in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. The Prince of Peace then sent his disciples out to preach the same message. See Luke chapter 10. Jesus Christ clearly said, The kingdom and other events, as we shall see, were at hand. A common response to these biblical statements of the imminence of the kingdom of God in the first century is this. Well, yes, the Bible says the kingdom was coming soon, but remember, one day with the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So you see, God doesn't see time as man does. God is above time. Now, is there anything wrong with that statement? Well, if God cannot tell time, there isn't. But if God can read a calendar, and if God truly meant to communicate with man, there is something drastically wrong. Essentially, what these statements say is that while God said that the kingdom was at hand in the first century, in reality, God cannot tell time. Therefore, at hand means nothing at all. This little tract is about several things. It is about the inspiration of the scriptures. It's about the faithfulness of God. It's about God's ability to communicate with mankind. It's about the kingdom of the Lord and other prophecy. It's about the changing of our preconceived ideas to bring them into harmony with God's word. Inspiration. The Bible says of itself that it is inspired. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. The original word translated inspired literally means God breathed. The thought of the Bible being from God suggests that since God is perfect or infallible, if the Bible is from him, it ought to be infallible as well. Specifically, if the Bible made a promise that something would happen within a specific time frame, if that event did not happen when and as promised, the Bible's claim to inspiration falls. Now, there are conditional promises in the Bible. In other words, God said at times, if you will do this, I will do that. When and if man failed to keep his part of the bargain, then God was no longer bound to fulfill his promise. But this does not prove a failed prophecy. It demonstrates just the opposite. God was keeping the negative provision of the prophecy. See Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. The promises we're studying in this tract were not conditional promises. As a matter of fact, Premillennialists very often insist that the promises of the kingdom were not conditional. We agree. The amillennialist observes that God promised to establish the kingdom in the days of the Roman Empire. See Daniel chapter 2. The premillennialist says that that was not done. The amillennialist points out that if that's true, then one part of God's promise failed. And that's a valid and true statement. If God does not keep the when part of his promises, then he's not kept his promise. The inspiration of the scripture demands complete fulfillment of every aspect of God's promises. So-called prophets of today like to point to some of their prediction, some part of it that seemed to come true, at least partially. To them, if any part of their prediction comes true, they claim victory. But this is not the biblical standard of determining the validity of a prophet. Partial fulfillment means complete failure. It is Jehovah himself that gave the criteria for determining whether a prophet was true or false. If a prophet's prediction did not come true, he was a false prophet. See Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 and following. God's words versus man's words. It seems to have escaped the notice of many that the Bible was written in the common languages of their respective authors. The Old Covenant was not written in some mystical form of Hebrew. 
It was written in the language spoken in the homes and the markets and the fields and the workplaces of the Jewish people. Now, we are not suggesting that much of this language was not figurative and apocalyptic. On the contrary, much of the prophetic literature is just that. What we are saying, however, is that even figurative portions of Scripture used types of language that the people knew. The Jews of old were familiar with apocalyptic language. They studied it every Sabbath. We today need to be far more familiar with this apocalyptic form of language and stop thinking so literally when we read about, say, the passing of heaven and earth. See Isaiah chapter 34, for instance. In regard to time, however, we need to see that while much language was figurative, it is unusual for time words to be used in that way. It is the same with the New Covenant. The New Testament Greek language is known as the Koine Greek, meaning the common Greek language of the day. The New Testament Greek, just like the Old Testament Hebrew, was the language of fishermen, carpenters, tent makers, and husbands and wives. So what's our point? Our point is that the Bible is not a book that used words normally meaning at hand or near to mean a long time off. When God said something was not near, it really was not near. And we will fully demonstrate this in this tract. But the very nature of the languages of the Bible should make one very cautious before insisting that God can't tell time. God, time, and communication. Are we saying that God is not above time? Are we saying God is bound to time like man? Not at all. God's years are endless. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Psalm 90, verse 2. Isaiah calls Jehovah the Father of Eternity. Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 9. But the fact that God is above time is irrelevant to this discussion. Now, if God were talking to God when he said certain events were at hand, we would be justified in saying that mankind would have no way of telling what words like soon or quickly meant. But in the Bible, God spoke to man. The time statements about the kingdom's establishment were made to man. The time statements in the Bible were spoken to man to encourage or to warn mankind. Now, if God did not mean time when he used time words, what did he mean? Since man thinks in time when words like a long time or at hand are used, wouldn't it have been misleading on God's part? to say something was not going to happen for a long time when in fact it was imminent? Conversely, would it not have been misleading for God to say something was at hand when it was really not to happen for centuries? The question here is one of communication. Can God communicate with his creation in an understandable way? Or does Jehovah speak in purposely ambiguous ways? Does the Lord hold out a carrot stick of imminent blessing to his hurting creation while knowing all along that he really is not going to bring the promises soon? Did God constantly threaten nations with imminent judgment and then not punish them for centuries? Where then is the reality of the threat to the wicked? Does God's transcendence over time prevent him from speaking to man in words that convey genuine nearness? Here's a question to consider. If God is in the practice of saying something is imminent, when in reality it may not transpire for centuries, why is there not one single Old Covenant prophecy of the kingdom that said it was at hand? Daniel said the kingdom would be established in the days of the Roman Empire. He called it the last days. See Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. From Daniel's perspective, it was several hundred years away. From God's perspective, of course, it was only a moment, but that's not the issue. God was speaking to Daniel about things to happen in man's world, not in timeless eternity. This is why God did not cause Daniel to say the kingdom was near or at hand or right at the door or coming very, very soon. It wasn't until John the baptizer came that the message, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, was preached, and the kingdom was established in the very generation that heard John say it was at hand. 
In other words, God did not allow his prophets to say the kingdom was at hand until it really was at hand. It would have been something less than honest of God if he had said that the kingdom was imminent when in reality it was hundreds and hundreds of years away. Why did Isaiah, who wrote over 600 years before the birth of the Messiah, never say Messiah's coming was at hand? Wouldn't it have been terribly distressing for the Jews to have heard a constant message of the imminence of the kingdom and their Savior, and yet hundreds and hundreds of years roll on and on without fulfillment? The writer of Proverbs correctly noted mankind's attitude towards waiting for fulfillment of promises. He wrote, quote, Hope that is deferred makes the heart sick. Proverbs 13, 12. Now, it's one thing for God to promise something and not give any indications as to when he would fulfill the promise. Then man has no indication of when to expect fulfillment. But it's an entirely different thing for God to indicate a time frame for fulfillment and then not bring the promise to fulfillment in the indicated time frame. This involves a basic attribute of the nature and character of God. God is faithful. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, we find the statement, With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. By the way, please note the verse does not say, One day is a thousand years with the Lord. Some millenarians insist that the earth will only stand for 6,000 years, followed by a thousand years of utopia. This is based on a mistaken association with the days of creation in 2 Peter chapter 3. In verse 9 of 2 Peter 3, we find a forgotten statement. Quote, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. The word translated slow is the Greek word braduno, which means just that, slow. Compare Paul's usage of the word in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Peter's point is, when God sets a time for fulfillment, he fulfills on time. He's not slow. God can tell time, and he knows how to keep his promises on time. This verse asserts in no uncertain terms that God is a God who keeps his promises. Now notice the inherent contradiction between this inspired statement of Peter and the claims of men today. The premillennialist admits that Jehovah promised to establish the kingdom in the days of the Roman Empire and that Jesus said the kingdom was at hand. Unfortunately, however, they claim that God was unable to complete his promise due to the unbelief of the Jews. Therefore, God postponed the kingdom to a later date. But wait, what happens then to Peter's inspired statement that says God is not slow about fulfilling his promises? What about the faithfulness of God that the Hebrew writer asserts in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18? The writer insists, quote, God cannot lie. Well, if God cannot lie, can he fail? Or can he alter his promises? If the premillennialist is right, and the appointed time for fulfillment has already come and gone, and God has not fulfilled the promise? then hasn't God been extremely slow in fulfilling his kingdom promises? But Peter said he wasn't. Has the faithfulness of God not been seriously called into question here? If God is as slow as the premillennial doctrine implies, then how can we be assured of any of his promises? We maintain that the faithfulness of God demands that we believe that he keeps his word, not only in the way that he promised, but when he promised. The time frame for fulfillment is as important as the how of fulfillment. God and Time In spite of the issue of the faithfulness of God, some writers insist that we must believe in what they call the elasticity of prophetic chronology, and that time, in connection with prophecy, is an exceedingly relative matter. We're told by these folks that prophetic time may indicate imminence when in fact hundreds of years are involved. Now, in order to demonstrate the utter falsity of this concept, 
Let's see how God has dealt with time statements in the scripture. In Numbers chapter 24, verses 17 through 18, Balaam the prophet made a prediction of Christ's coming. He says, quote, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Notice that Balaam said Christ's coming was not near. It was not at hand. Now, why did Balaam say this? Because Christ's coming was over 1,400 years away at that time. And 1,400 years really is a long time. So here we have a concrete example where God referred to a long time as just that. In Daniel chapters 10 through 12, Daniel is having a vision encompassing a period of time from 536 BC to the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, so about 600 years. Two times in this text, Daniel was told, quote, the appointed time is long and the vision refers to many days to come. See chapter 10 verse 1 and verse 14. Now remember, this vision was relayed to Daniel directly from God. Now, while God is not bound by time, he was communicating to man, who is bound by time. God called this 600-year period of time long. He said it involved many days. God can most assuredly tell time, and God can read a calendar. Now, the book of Daniel contains another very important example of how God used time words. Chapter 8 contains a prophecy that extends from 530 B.C. to about 165 B.C., and this concerns the death of Antiochus Epiphanes. The time covered here is about 365 years. Now, how did God express that prophecy? Did he say it was at hand or near? Did he say some of it was at hand, while some of it was a long way off? No. God viewed the prophecy as a whole. He said the vision, quote, refers to many days in the future, end quote. See chapter 8 of Daniel, verse 26. Now here's a prophecy that covers 365 years, and God called it a long time. Friends, if God called 365 years a long time, then how does man say that time, when God is speaking to man, means nothing? Now, this is a very important question, especially in light of the traditional interpretation of the book of Revelation. Daniel was told to seal up his vision because the time for its fulfillment was a long time off, 365 years off. In the book of Revelation, the apostle John was specifically told not to seal up his vision because what he saw was at hand. See Revelation chapter 22 verse 10. John is told that his vision was at hand and must shortly come to pass. Now, listener, I ask you, did God call the 365 years for the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy a long time and mean a long time, and then call the fulfillment of Revelation at hand and not mean at hand? Did he say one was a long way off and mean it, and the other was near and not mean it? To say the least, this would hardly be consistent. In Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 10, Jehovah told his prophet that the Babylonian captivity would last for 70 years. In verse 28, the people complained that Jeremiah had told them, quote, the exile will be long. Now, here's another example of a prophet specifying a period of time, 70 years, and the people of Israel saying to the prophet, and remember, this prophet was inspired by God, they're saying to him that the captivity would be long. Now, why was 70 years called a long time by Jeremiah? Because to man, 70 years is a long time. Thus, God used time words as man would normally understand them. Folks, God can tell time. Now, many don't realize that the Bible actually gives us examples of man trying to change the meaning of time words as used by God. And it gives us God's response as well. 
In Ezekiel chapter 7, God, through Ezekiel, said that the day of the Lord was at hand. The day of the Lord in this context was when God used Babylon to punish Israel for her sin. This is the concept of the day of the Lord. It is not an end of time idea, but it refers to a time when God used one nation to punish another nation as it related to his chosen people Israel. Then in chapter 11 of Ezekiel, Israel responded to the threat of coming judgment. They insisted that although Ezekiel said it was at hand, it was really not at hand. They said instead it was a time to build houses and not to worry about God's judgment. Now one can almost hear some of those people way back then saying, well, yes, Ezekiel, God has said that the day of the Lord is at hand, but after all, Psalm 90 verse 4 says, one day is with the Lord like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. When national Israel elastitized God's words of imminence into relativity, ambiguity, and meaninglessness, God responded. In Ezekiel chapter 12 verses 21 and following, please take the time to Get out your Bible and read those verses for yourself. God told Ezekiel to tell Israel that her days of changing the time of his predictions were over. He said judgment was at hand. Israel said it was not at hand. And Jehovah would not tolerate that. Ezekiel was instructed to tell Israel that in that generation, Judgment would fall upon them, just as Jehovah had indicated when he said it was at hand. So what we have then is another example of man saying that while God had said something was imminent, man says it really wasn't imminent, that it was really a long time off. And we have God's response when he said, at hand means at hand. He did not mean hundreds or thousands of years later. He meant soon. Now, another example of man changing the meaning of God's time words is in Amos chapter 6, verse 3. God warned Israel that the time had come for her to be judged. See Amos chapter 8, verse 2, and Hosea chapter 1, verse 4. But despite warning, Israel, quote, put far off the evil day. Isaiah 56, 12 shows that they were saying, quote, tomorrow shall be as today, end quote. So in spite of God's warning that judgment was at hand, they insisted all things continue as they were, just like in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. They refused to believe God actually meant near when he said near. And as a result, God said woe to them. So listener, I ask you this. What is the practical difference between Israel of old denying that at hand actually meant soon and the Bible students of today who read the New Testament time statements and say that they did not actually mean soon either? What is the difference between those living in Isaiah's day who denied the warnings of God's imminent judgment, saying life was going to go on as usual, and those people today that read the time statements made in the first century? and say that the predicted events were not truly imminent. Those who deny the first century application of the at-hand time statements of the New Testament are doing the same thing as the Israelites of old did, denying that at-hand actually meant soon. Upon what basis, then, can one acknowledge that God condemned Old Testament Israel for changing his words at-hand to mean a long time, and then think that it's justifiable for modern man to do the same thing when studying the New Testament. Israel of old, like some today, apparently argued that time doesn't mean anything to God. And as we already referenced, they had Psalm 90 verse 4 when Amos and Ezekiel were written, and they could very well have been appealing to that verse as justification for saying, at hand did not actually mean soon. And when they so argued, God condemned their rationalization. So what's changed with God? What's changed that now allows modern man to go to the new covenant promises 
which say that certain events were at hand in the first century, and then change those statements of imminence to make them say that they've not been fulfilled, even after 2,000 years so far. Has God changed his vocabulary? Is it true that at hand once did mean near, but now it means a long time off? And if that's the case, where's the evidence for that change? Now, surely the honest student can clearly see that there's been no such change in God's vocabulary. God can tell time. God can read a calendar. And when God says something is at hand, it is near. And for man to argue otherwise is to reject the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. It's to impugn the faithfulness of God. It's to impugn the ability of God to communicate to his creation. It's to do the very same thing Israel of old did, and for that they were condemned. Listener, this is a very serious matter indeed. Making an Application Chances are, if you're an amillennialist, you've pretty much agreed with this tract so far. If you're a premillennialist, hopefully you've seen the power of the language of imminence in the Bible. That language is very powerful and very significant, and we wish to demonstrate in the remainder of this tract that the issues we've raised have serious implications for both amillennialists and premillennialists. If the time statements of the Bible are to be understood as truly communicating what the words themselves normally mean, and we believe that we have sufficiently demonstrated that they do, then the traditional views of eschatology are presented with some insurmountable problems. In other words, if a long time really means a long time in man's concept of time, and if at hand truly means nearness and imminence means nearness, then the traditional eschatological interpretations are false. Now, everyone admits there are numerous New Testament passages that say the coming of the Lord is near or at hand, or in other ways, the New Testament indicates that Christ's return was near, and that was almost two millennia ago. So one of the ways that men have dealt with this problem is to say, yes, the Bible did say the coming of the Lord was near in the first century, but time doesn't mean anything to God, and therefore at hand didn't really mean at hand. It didn't really mean that his coming was imminent. Listener, do you see the problem here? This problem is real, and it's troubled honest Bible students for centuries. The question is, can God tell time? And as we have seen, when God uses time words, he doesn't have a special hidden meaning that's unknowable to man. The prophetic time statements in the Bible are not so elastic that the words near and at hand can be made to encompass hundreds or even thousands of years. At hand means at hand, whether it's referring to the coming of the kingdom or the coming of the Lord. Now, if, as the amillennialist insists, it's dangerous to deny the time for the coming of the kingdom, why is it not equally as dangerous to deny the time frame for the coming of the Lord? It's clear to this scribe that to deny either the fact or the time for the coming of the Lord is to deny the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures, and this is a serious matter indeed. Now, just how clearly does the New Testament affirm the imminence of the coming of the Lord? Let's take a look at the evidence. Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, Jesus said he would return in the lifetime of his disciples. Matthew chapter 16, verses 27 and 28. Jesus said he would return with his angels to judge all men before everyone standing there died. Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 34. Jesus said he would return in the clouds with his angels in that generation. Acts chapter 3, verses 19 and following. Peter said Jesus would return when all the Old Covenant prophecies were fulfilled. Yet, if the Old Covenant prophecies have not been fulfilled yet, then the Old Covenant is still in effect. See Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. Romans chapter 13, verse 12. 
Paul said, the day is at hand. Romans chapter 16, verse 20, Paul said, God will, quote, bruise Satan under your feet shortly. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, Paul said the Corinthians would have the miraculous gifts until the end, that is the day of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 28 through 31. Paul said, the fashion of this world is passing away and the time is short. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and following. Paul said that not all of them, then living, would die before the resurrection. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 through chapter 4, verse 5. Paul spoke of the resurrection at Christ's coming and said, the Lord is at hand. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 14, Paul tells Timothy to live faithfully until the appearing of our Lord. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 28, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 37, the writer says Christ would appear a second time for salvation and then asserted, quote, in a very, very little while, he that will come, will come and he will not delay. Now, isn't it sad that man says Christ has delayed in spite of what the Bible says? So what does biblical inspiration mean? Did the writer lie? Was he mistaken? James chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. Here, James urges his readers to be faithful until the coming of the Lord. He says, quote, the coming of the Lord is at hand and the judge is standing right at the door. First Peter chapter four, verses five, seven and 17. Peter said Jesus was then ready to judge the living and the dead. He says the end of all things is at hand. And again, the time has come for the judgment to begin at the house of God. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 18. John said the world was passing away and it is the last hour. The book of Revelation. This book says no less than 10 times that its predictions must shortly come to pass, that they were at hand, that they were to happen quickly, and that there would be no more delay. Now, listener, these are not by any means all of the verses that either directly state that Christ's return was at hand or indirectly state it. So what will you do with these verses in God's inspired word? Do you realize that there's not one verse in the Bible that uses language of imminence about the coming of the kingdom that's as strong as some of the language about the coming of the Lord? Hebrews chapter 10 verse 37 says that he who is coming will come in a very, very little while. Now, Christ never said in a very, very little while the kingdom will come. He said at hand, but not in a very, very little while. But the inspired writers of scripture said it about the coming of Jesus. So if as the amillennialist correctly insists that we must acknowledge the strong language of imminence in regard to the coming of the kingdom, must we not also acknowledge the even stronger language that's used in reference to the coming of the Lord? And if not, why not? Now someone will respond to what I'm saying by saying, but wait, everyone knows that Christ has not returned because the earth and time continue. Every man did not see him come back, therefore he did not come back. The problem here is one of preconceived ideas. The prevailing idea about Christ's return says that he will come back bodily, on an actual cloud with real angels, that time will end as the physical earth is burned up and every nation and all the dead will be raised out of physical graves to stand before Christ and be judged. Now, obviously, from a physical perspective, all of that has not happened. But isn't it just possible that that concept of the day of the Lord is wrong? If you've agreed with our investigation about God's use of time words, 
then you're forced to rethink your concept about the nature of the day of the Lord, or else you have to call the inspiration of Scripture into question. So which will it be? The day of the Lord. Now space forbids a full discussion of the nature of the day of the Lord here, and may we recommend that you obtain copies of our other works that can be found at eschatology.org. Briefly, however, we will give a definition of the coming of the Lord. Just as the restoration of the kingdom of Israel was a spiritual and not a physical restoration, so was the return of Christ a spiritual and not a physical event as well. See Acts chapter 1 verse 6, chapter 2 verses 29 and following, chapter 3 verses 19 and following, and chapter 15 verses 14 and following. Now in the Old Covenant, the coming of the Lord was when Jehovah acted by instrumental means to judge a nation or a people. The language used to describe the event often sounds like the end of the world, the end of creation, but it was in fact only the end of the world that was under consideration. God is said to ride on a cloud into Egypt in judgment, but he didn't bodily ride on a cloud into the nation of Egypt. It was the Assyrians who destroyed Egypt. But since God used the Assyrians to destroy Egypt, God was said to come with the clouds. See Isaiah chapters 19 and 20. God predicted Edom's destruction at the hands of the Babylonians in Isaiah chapter 34. Well, the wording sounds like the end of material creation. The earth was to be burned and melt. The stars would fall from the sky. But this didn't literally happen, of course. It was Edom that was destroyed. See Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. It was the day of the Lord for Edom. God acted, and therefore he came. In Psalm 18, David describes in graphic detail how God had delivered him from Saul and from his enemies. And he says that God, quote, descended on the clouds, the earth was shaken, and all creation was moved. Well, this didn't literally happen. This is highly symbolic language describing God's actions. The technical term for this language is apocalyptic language. The apocalyptic language was never intended to be taken literally, and it leads to direct contradictions when it's literalized. When Jesus promised to return, quote, with the clouds and his angels, he was using standard apocalyptic language to describe the time when he would put a full end to the old world of Judaism. In 2 Peter chapter 3, when Peter described the day of the Lord, when heaven and earth would perish, he was using Old Covenant apocalyptic language. Peter was Jewish. He was, he was using this language to predict the very same day that Jesus spoke of, the day of the Lord, the day when Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70. In A.D. 70, Jesus destroyed the old world of Judaism that had stood for over 1,500 years. The temple was the only place on earth where sacrifices could be offered to Jehovah. And only genealogically confirmed Levites could offer those sacrifices. National Israel had been God's chosen people to bring Messiah and his word into the world. In the first century, that purpose was accomplished, and Israel had rejected her own Messiah and his kingdom. Concurrently, God was establishing a new covenant and a new people. And when that new covenant was fully delivered and fully confirmed, and when the old covenant people had fully rejected it, Christ came to them in judgment. He took that old nation out of the way. When Jerusalem was destroyed... Jesus' claims were fully vindicated by the fulfillment of all prophecy. See Luke chapter 21, verse 22. And Jesus was, quote, seen, unquote, to be true when his predictions came to pass. He was revealed to be at the right hand of power on high when his prediction of Jerusalem's fall came to pass. This was the coming of the Lord. In short, Jesus never predicted to bodily return to this earth. 
This extremely simplified explanation will hopefully cause you to want to study more. You may not be familiar with these ideas, but we hope that we have at least piqued your curiosity. Now, this one fact remains. Jesus promised to return in the generation of his disciples. Language could not be clearer. We have demonstrated above that when God used time words, he meant what the words clearly suggest. At hand means at hand. A long time means a long time. This being true, one must acknowledge either one, Jesus lied, two, Jesus failed, three, Jesus was mistaken, or four, Jesus came just like he said he would. The Bible is either inspired or it's not inspired. I believe that it is. I believe Jesus also did not lie, that he did not fail, and that he did not make a mistake. This is why I have changed my mind about the nature of the coming of the Lord. God truly can tell time. God can read a calendar. In the clearest language possible, he predicted the time, not the day or the hour, but the generation of Christ's return. And that was the first century generation. The only way to maintain a belief in the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures and in Jesus Christ is to be willing to believe that he kept his word. And this may mean a change in your beliefs about the nature of the coming of Christ. Are you willing to change? This has been a Lightshine Media production. For information on how you could have your audiobook professionally recorded, please visit our website at lightshine.ad70.net. Lightshine, advancing a thinking faith.